Welcome to Sharptown Church. I hope you're all doing well this morning. I want to invite you to, if you're in the back, come on in. If you're sitting down, would you stand with me? I hope you all had a great week, and uh, I'm excited to be here with you this morning at church. We're going to spend some time singing together. Um, how you feeling? <laughs> you good? All right, I want you all to say good morning, Jeremiah, at the same time. Ready? One, two, three. Good morning, Jeremiah. Awesome. You make me feel so welcome. And uh, we're going to sing. It's kind of stripped down this morning a little bit. We're going to have some fun. Um, but I want to invite you to clap your hands, sing these songs out. You know them. Uh, this song is called Holy is the Lord. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down and worship Him now How great, how awesome is He And together we sing Everyone sing Holy is Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is Lord God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. Are you guys afraid of clapping? <laughs> Let's try it. I know it's early. Let's try it again. Here we go. We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength We bow down Worship Him now, how great, how awesome is He, and together we sing, everyone sing. Oh 
Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life. Oh, he is my song. You are good. gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down you're never gonna let never gonna let me down We're here to celebrate a good God again this Sunday morning. Sharptown Church, once again, welcome to worship. We're glad you're here. Before you sit down, take a moment and say hello to the folks around you. Perhaps learn a new name. Give someone a hug this morning. If you're joining us online, say hello and let us know where you're worshiping from.
You got it. Well, we're so glad to see a full house again this morning. I'm so happy the weather is finally warm and it stopped raining. Hallelujah. Hey, we have a treat this morning. I want to introduce you. I know her already. Our youth director, Erica, and some of our students, they are headed out for an overseas mission trip very soon, and we're excited, or they're excited, to tell you about it. Well, we have a number of people going, and a lot of them are actually away, which is kind of funny. Um, so we have AJ, who's not here, Cody, who's not here, and my husband Kyle just went away this morning. So I'm going to introduce you to who is here. We have Megan, Audrey, Izzy, and Gracie. And they're going to tell us a little bit about the missions opportunity that we have to go on. Go ahead, Megan. Hi, everyone. Put your mouth closer. Closer. <laughs> okay, so we're going to Palatunga, Ecuador from June 30th to July 9th, where we will be working with a local church plant there to provide for some needs in the community. Some of the things we'll be doing Close includes, them. sorry. Some of the things we will be doing <laughs> includes packaging and donating food to as many families in the community as possible, serving in the church with nightly kids programs, and cooking a meal to serve to the community through the church on Friday. We will also be involved in some cultural experiences, which include helping to teach a couple of English classes in the local school, as well as creating a joyful atmosphere in a senior citizen's home with games. We are extremely excited for this mission trip that is going to provide us with a hands-on opportunity so we can learn what it means to live out the Great Commission and be the hands and feet of Christ. We know we will make a positive influence on Christ while we're there. Wonderful. So, church. This might be deja vu for some of you. It was probably eight years ago I stood up here and asked for support to go to Ecuador for a year. And now I have the opportunity to take a group of kids from Sharptown to do the same thing. And I just think that's so cool on your part. Um, I am really, really, really excited for this trip because I know the difference that I've made in my life. And I'm hoping that makes a huge difference in their lives as well. So we're heading to Ecuador with their name or Kim. Kim and Guido, I lived with them for about three months when I was there. Uh, they serve in a town called Payatunga for about 18 years together. And they are going to be like the best role models ever that your kids could have. These people are selfless. They, they planted a church um, and they devote almost all their time to it. Like anything they can do to help the people in the community, like that's what, what they do. Um, Matthew 25, verses 35 through 40 says, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then they asked him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least, the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. And the Bible constantly tells us, take care of the sick, um, take care of the oppressed, take care of the orphans, take care of the widows. And like Jesus showed us, it's not just about reading the Bible, it's about going and living it out. And so in Payatunga, we have several opportunities to take care of basic needs, and it's taken us a while to even figure out what we're going to do because there's so much that we could do. Uh, and after some more brainstorming this week, we decided we would pack up food and just take it even door to door. And I'm so excited about this because it is really a basic need, food and clean water. And um, that's what Jesus calls us to do. So this is also a really amazing opportunity for us to go and support the local shops, because it is a third world country. So to support the local businesses there as well. And then like door to door is just really cool. I am hoping that we'll be able to pray over people while we're there and share the gospel and that the power of God will be shown in these instances, not only to the families we're taking care about, but like 
to show to them. Like, I'm hoping for, like, transformation for all of us. Um, so I'm asking for a couple of things. One is definitely prayer. So I have a couple of prayer requests. So get out your notebooks. <laughs> um, <laughs> the first is for the people of Payatunga, that they'll be ready to receive not only us, but Jesus Christ, and that lives will be transformed because we took 10 days out of our entire lives to go and do this. Uh, that's to serve in a third world country where there's severe need. And the second is that I'm praying that this trip will be absolutely transformational for our team, that God's power is going to be revealed and so that it's undeniable, um, and that we can understand the importance of evangelism and the need for Jesus in the United States as well, and that this trip will conjure up some boldness to share Christ. So with that being said, some of you guys might have seen it out there in the hallway already. There's a picture on the screen. We're doing a fundraiser. Um, and it's kind of cool, but listen really carefully. If I miss anything, <laughs> help me. Um, so there's envelopes labeled from the number 1 to 150. So if we can get all these envelopes filled with the dollar amount that's on there, we'll be able to raise over $11,000, which will help with our flights. And the more money we raise, the more families we'll be able to feed. Um, so these envelopes, I'll say this first, don't leave the building. So I know some of you will not have money today. That's fine. Bring it next week. So ask God, God, what amount do you want me to give? Let's say he says 88. You come back next week, 88's gone. What do you do? You just put it in 87 or 86 or 85, right? Don't panic. Um, so <laughs> ask God the amount that he wants you to give. Bring the money to church. Take the envelope off and walk out to the lobby. That way there's not, like, any congestion in there. You put the money in the envelope, and on your way out, there's a table with, like, an Ecuadorian flag on there. These guys will be standing there, and there's a box. You'll put the envelope in. Questions? <laughs> what do you think? Did I miss anything? There's also a um, piece of paper out there if you want to write your name and address. We would love to also send you a thank you note. Um, we're really excited, and I'm really excited to come back and share about the things that we did. And Yeah. What now? <laughs> <laughs> So church, you heard that. Do the envelopes leave the building? No. What happens if you don't bring money this week? Bring it next week. Erica, when are you hoping to have these filled? Next week? Oh. <laughs> by, the, by the end of May. By the end of May. I have a short, Erica. I think they're going to be filled way sooner than that. So we're excited that you're taking our kids on a mission trip. We're thrilled. And to kids, if you want to help, like if you want to go find some quarters, you can help us. If you guys want to leave like 1 to 20 open, let the kids grab those. That would be really cool. That would be awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You see it on the screen. It could be cash or it could be check. Make sure you put youth missions on that if you put a check in there. I think that's pretty clear. Great job, guys. We'll be paying for you. Nicely done. So just a couple other things to highlight. We mentioned this last week, and we do this each and every year. We have a scholarship that we award to one graduating senior boy and one graduating senior girl. And so if you are graduating high school this year, we invite you to apply for that scholarship. It's given in honor of Lori Buckner's parents. And so started many years ago and have blessed many of our students over the years. Applications are available in the lobby and on the church website. Dawn mentioned last week about Help for Vacation Bible School. Just want to keep that in front of you. Uh, the directions on how to sign up to help are there. You can just scan the QR code. It'll take you right to the sign-up link. Many of you offered to help last week, which is just absolutely amazing. So, church, you're just wonderful. 
We have a blood drive coming up here on May the 16th. You can sign up directly with the redcross.org. And then as a reminder, we continue walking on Tuesday nights. The weather has finally broke, so this should be nice, Amy. Amy's been leading folks to walk in the wind and in the rain on Tuesday nights. Uh, but this week should be wonderful, so come if, if you're available any Tuesday that you would like to just join us at the park. God Squad is in session for our kids. It started this week. There's a Bible study also on Wednesday night that Amber Llewellyn is leading. A number of other things that are in front of you, you can take a look in the bulletin. And then we have one... One new announcement. I'm going to turn that over to Jeremiah. We have something exciting happening. Yes. So, fellas, uh, we are planning our second annual Bago Cornhole Tournament. Uh, it's going to happen quick. Look, let's be honest. We're guys. We don't need a lot of, like, heads up. We just go when our wives tell us to go. We don't even look at the calendar half the time. May 20th. It's a Saturday late afternoon. We're going to hang out right out here. Um, we're going to have some kind of, we're working out the details, but the 20th of May, which is a Saturday, we're not going to do it in the morning. Look, you can do whatever you need to do in the, in the morning, afternoon, come like late afternoon. We're going to have some food. We're going to have some fun and we're going to see who the champions are this year. We're going to rub shoulders together. We're going to open the word for a little bit. Um, it's going to be a great time. We're going to send you some information this week. Uh, if we don't have your email address or your contact, get it to us. Uh, we're going to blast that out, and then we'll have a sign-up next week. All right? I'll talk to you soon. Thanks. So that's 13 days from today. Yep, no excuses. Perfect. Put on the calendar. Watch. Not a lot of time to think about. Just decide to come. Wonderful. Thanks, Jeremiah. All right, this time we're going to invite our ushers to come forward, and our students are dismissed to Graceland. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, you are so good to us. You're so generous and so kind. We're grateful for the ways that you provide for all of our needs. Father, at this point in the service each and every week, we give back to you a portion of what you've entrusted us with. God, we pray that you would bless this offering so that it would make a difference that your kingdom would be lifted high. God, we're thrilled this morning that our students are going to be going to Ecuador and lifting your name high. God, may you already go before all the details of that trip and the request that Erica has laid before us today. God, would you bless this offering so that people would come to know more about who you are, not only in the walls of this building, but around our county and around our state, around our country and around our world. And God, so we ask a blessing over this offering and those who give. We love you, and this is an act of worship, and so we worship you. In your name we pray. Amen. He is jealous for me Love's like a hurricane I am a tree Bending beneath The weight of his wind and mercy 
When all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me and oh how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us so jealous for me I love's like a hurricane I am a tree bending beneath the weight of his wind and mercy when all of a sudden I am unaware of these afflictions eclipsed by glory and I realize just how beautiful you are and how great your affections are for me. And oh, how he loves us so. Oh, how he loves us. How he loves us so. And oh, how he loves us so oh how he loves us how he loves us
For those who are still seated, would you stand with me, please? Let's bow together. This morning, Lord, we would ask that your goodness would be so very real to us that our hearts would even explode within our, in our chest the reality of your goodness would be so near to each one of us that we would understand that there's not anything in and of ourselves that we bring, but it's simply to the cross that we cling. And so this morning, we turn our attention completely in your direction. And Lord, as we become convinced of your goodness and your faithfulness, as we become convinced of your character and your nature, that we pray that we would consistently, continuously, in all moments and at all times, be able to trust you and place ourselves in your hands. That's hard sometimes. Our eyes get diverted. Our hearts deceive us. But this morning, Lord, we just confess that you'll move inside of this place today and ask that you will come and, and be lifted high. And when we see you high and lifted up, we'll become convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are the one that we can place all of our trust, all of our confidence, all of our life's circumstances. And to that end, Lord, we pray you'll continue to move in this place by your spirit. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> grab that microphone. Can you grab that microphone? So as uh, Erica was reflecting back just a few moments ago, not nearly eight years ago, but uh, certainly just a few weeks ago, uh, you were seated here on this platform. Molly Tyler, welcome home from Africa. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Should be good. Let him, let him go home. Thank you. And so uh, you were in Zambia uh, for a semester abroad, right? You uh, are currently a student at Indiana Wesleyan University in nursing, and so you took a practicum semester there. Uh, and uh, listen, uh, how you doing? Pretty? Is it working? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Really, really well. Um, I'll tell you, I did not expect, when we were planning to go and when we were talking about how excited we were, some of the girls on the team, there were 13 of us, and some of them were like, wow, it's so crazy that we're living in Zambia for three months. And I'm not usually...
usually a cynic, and usually I'm more of the exaggerating optimist, but for some reason I was like, that's just, no, like it's not quite, like you're being dramatic, you just want to flex that, that's not really how it is, but I was so wrong. Um, Zambia truly feels like home, and so uh, coming out a few weeks since returning and um, some of the headache of travel and being awake for like 56 hours straight and suddenly I'm a night owl but I'm going to bed at 9 p.m. every night am I old what is this um, outside of all of that I'm starting to really feel homesick for this place that I've mm -hmm. really grown to love and so that's acutely um, I'd say what's kind of been on my heart I wake up and it's weird that I'm, I'm not sleeping on top of another girl and mm -hmm. there's 13 other people all around me mm -hmm. and we're all eating dinner together but um, even outside of just the cultural things so let's go ahead. When did you get home? Yes, I was home right before Easter. Um, I was in five countries over a week with travel. Um, we went to Botswana for safari, back to Zambia, uh, down to South Africa, up to London, and then to Yeah, col college life, right? <laughs> Good <laughs> gracious. Good for you. Yeah, Good I'm for you. so well traveled. The Lon London airport really, really showed me that, that country for sure. So let's go, uh, let's go rapid fire questions. Yes. Uh, unexpected thing, something on the trip, what's something completely unexpected? This is super cheesy, but I did not expect to be able to call Zambia home the way that I did. Um, and also chickens, they're everywhere. Hold um, on a second, let's do this. I got this. You know, with Salem County, we have a lot more chickens than probably the average place in New Jersey. Thank you. But not like Zambia. I mean, you're walking in the market, and then there's a guy on his bike, and there's chickens in this basket. There's a car driving by, and there's not very many cars, but there's one road in Zambia, and we lived on it um, in one of our towns. And so there's chickens on top of the car. We come home from a day of outreach doing medical work in the bush, which is like the really rural part. And my clinical instructor has a chicken, and she's chicken poop all over because she had to ride like 50 minutes in this bumpy truck because they gave us a chicken, and now he's in our bathtub, and then we ate him for dinner. We named him Walter. Um, <laughs> but I did not, love I that. really didn't think that there'd be chickens, ev like they're just everywhere. I have chicken pajamas now. I, I loved it. It was, it was so much fun. Is that the craziest cross-cultural experience? Um, I could not, I cannot think of the best answer for this, but, um, there were lots of animals, and I mentioned the bush. That's the really, um, kind of, specifically in different towns, the more rural parts, so for us, I would say like LAC is the Salem County Bush. Um, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, folks. <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> um, and so for the bush, it's it's a really it's quite a hike. And so we took what's called an ox cart, and it's just a little wooden trunk with oxen that would pull us. And um, one time we were going, and uh, our ox cart got a flat tire. There were two of them, and so all of a sudden there's. 23 of us, I think, piled into this little ox cart. I don't think I have a photo of it, but um, that was pretty wild. And then another ox cart trip, uh, my friend is kind of perched right behind where the ox are. They're probably right here. Um, and there's this kid, you know, doing his thing to get the oxes going. And then all of a sudden, she had a white t-shirt on, and she's like, what is, what is on my shirt? And the ox was parting all over her. And so she shows up to church with like ox excrement. All, it was so silly. Um, and so there were quite a few just funny, like we did not think that's how our day was gonna go. My clinical instructor did not think she was gonna be riding home with this huge chicken on her lap. And you wake up and there's another chicken somehow in the bathtub. I don't really know, it's like an outdoor bathtub. I don't know why our town had an outdoor bathtub at our house, but um, there's just, with Zambia they say that um, when you're talking about transcultural things and how different countries are oriented with time. Some are very future oriented, and so that's certainly the United States. Um, we all have calendars. I know where I'm gonna be, you know, in May of 2025, but with Zambia, they're more present oriented, and so things are just very focused on where you are in the moment right now. And so sometimes it just brings you in places and with people uh, in the most beautiful ways, even just outside of ox poop getting all over your white t-shirt. Um, that you never really even thought would happen. And I think that it was in those moments where we um, really were just open to what was, what was around us, where God wanted us in, in that specific time where he showed up the most. But First thing you did when you got back stateside? My vote would have been some cream chipped beef at a diner, uh, but my sister does not like that. So I got sushi instead okay. and slept, lots right. of sleeping. Hardest thing about being away for that long? Um, so I mentioned that there's 13 girls. We're all up there in the 
read uh, in front of one of the hospitals, but it is, I did not think that I was someone who really needed much space or much quiet or much alone <laughs> time. Um, I was wrong. Uh, it is, there were a few moments where I would, you know, wake up and have my Bible and I'm going to sit with coffee and someone is screaming at eight in the morning and I don't know why someone's screaming. And, you know, I grew up at camp. It, it felt a lot like camp uh, for a while, but I think that that was really, truly the only challenge. And I'm not, I'm not lying. I, I would be more honest if I had a different answer, but I think Zambia, again, it just really began to feel like home. Uh, and my only ad slight adjustment to that home would maybe be a little bit more opportunity for some quiet and some more alone time than being packed so tightly with 13 when you, girls. When you travel cross-culturally, certainly you can't bring the sounds back and the smells back with you, right, and all of those things. And so uh, the stories kind of become a little bit one-dimensional, and I'm sure that there are a thousand stories we can talk about uh, today, but uh, is there one particular that kind of stands out for you that, that kind of defines your trip? Yes, so uh, we spent a lot of time in, the cl in clinical, more than I ever would in the United States uh, as a student at IWU, and uh, for our rotations, I remember sharing, they were maternal and pediatric care, and so each day we would kind of, our group would be split up, and so part of the group would be at the maternal ward, and part of the group would be in the pediatric ward. They also had a little NICU, and so we kind of never really knew where we were going to be each day, and my group, part of, part of my group was assigned to the NICU for one day, and we, at that point, had gotten really comfortable. Uh, something really, really beautiful and, and sweet about uh, serving and being a nursing student in Zambia is that you can do a whole lot more, so by then, we kind of just felt like nurses. Yeah. Uh, which is really, really special. And so we were taking care of this little NICU baby. Uh, they're very teeny. And I think, yeah, there's, there's a little NICU baby. This wasn't the particular one, but they're very little. And uh, a lot of times they're, by the time they're in the NICU, um, because so many of them, I'm sure if they were in the United States, many of the babies born would probably be in what we would call our, our neonatal intensive care unit, but because of resources and just um, allocating care and who, what's available, uh, a lot of the babies were just kind of in the normal postpartum ward, and so this baby who was in the NICU was um, really, really uh, struggling, and so we're taking care of her, and she um, was just not doing too great, and I, I think, got pulled away to go, go somewhere, but we had four of us were taking care of this baby all day, and then uh, we're sitting, and one of the girls from our group comes in, and she's just, like, you can just tell on her face by then, I think we'd been living together for two months. I just knew something, something wasn't right with Maddie. And uh, as it happened, the baby had passed away. And uh, that wasn't something that I wasn't expecting. Uh, they really did do a good job briefing us that we would encounter hard things. We would encounter things where um, perhaps if they were in the United States, it would look different for this child. But, um, and I had, I had already reconciled with that, but uh, it's a big jump from something that might happen to it actually very acutely happening. And then we find ourselves, um, I kind of, I don't know, something just, the switch flipped in my head, and I think that God had just given me clarity on what to do in that moment. And uh, we made sure that the mom could see her baby, and we went to a separate room, and there were four of us, including myself, and I ended up finding a specific liturgy that I had already saved on my phone. Um, I didn't really know why and it was for that specific moment, and it just really centered our hearts on eternity and um, the hope of Jesus Christ, but the fact that he also meets us in our sorrows, um, and it was crushing. It was not something that I really kind of thought that I would experience. I knew things would be hard, but I didn't realize um, how hard it would be to actually face it and actually um, experience it in the moment, and as we were praying, as we are um, just reflecting on what it means for Jesus to die for us and that that baby was in the arms of Christ. Um, our hearts were just really, really molded and shaped. We ended up later that night uh, sharing that with our team, and then we went back for night shift, evening clinical, and I just remember the stars were stunning. I think if we go to the next slide, there's a picture, uh, and it's not gonna show how great the night sky is. It's the, the black square at the bottom. Um, and we ended up just, we had some downtime, we were stargazing, we were caring for moms in the antenatal ward, which is uh, before you have a baby. And so at that point, uh, we had kind of recovered from what had happened, and we prayed, and we were just looking at God's majesty and his creation, having just reflected on, um, again, eternity and salvation and, uh, again, what it means for Jesus to have died for us. And then 
Later, we found ourselves singing Tonga worship songs. Tonga is one of their many languages, and our in-country host, Bob Brenda, she's the lady uh, in the picture, the group picture at the bottom in front of a river in the middle. And Bob Brenda had taught us so many worship songs, and so we were singing them with all of these moms packed into one little room. It's kind of like a big sleepover, and God had just provided so many ways um, to just center our hearts on him amidst this really hard and heartbreaking thing, um, and it just gave us, not only us, a lot of hope, but it was so beautiful to just reflect on his goodness with all of these cute little moms who are about to bring new life into the world, just as we um, had experienced loss in the way that we did, and then to reflect on God's goodness even just in the stars. Uh, he just, in that moment, really met us where we were and reminded us who he was, um, his majesty, and that, you know, we were exactly where we wanted to be needed to be and where where God wanted us to be and that that baby is is the same even if it's not what we would have wanted and not the story that we would have written for that baby um, so that's really one of the things that happens inside of these uh, cross-cultural mission experiences it's the fact that because you don't see things you normally would see or you meet people you don't normally meet and have a chance to be in in circumstances where you're not typically there uh, we get a change of perspective and because of that God has a chance to access our heart a little bit uh, poor, more readily, I guess, than we would normally be in, inside of routine. Uh, there are challenges to our faith, and he stretches us in ways we never thought. Talk to us a little bit about ways that you have grown as a person, and more specifically about how your faith has grown. Yeah, so um, as you might imagine, life in Zambia looks very different than the United States. I mentioned that whole present time orientation thing. The team and I would joke that that's why we were late um, to church, because we were present time oriented, not because somebody slept in too late. And um, just the way that life was done in Zambia, um, the ability to be late to clinical because you stopped to have a conversation with someone, or being able to, on your way to class, also being late to class, uh, stop and in the market and see friends, and just the way that the even people lived out their lives, their generosity, um, experiencing God through even just cute little kids who were ripping your hair out, don't, don't look underneath my hair, I have none of it anymore because they were always wanting to braid it. Um, I just really began to live, live life differently um, and sensed God's presence and experienced him in ways that I had never experienced him before, um, specifically in creation, through the generosity of the Zambians, um, through moments like singing worship songs in the antenatal ward, looking at the stars, and um, I found myself prior to coming to Zambia, um, what I would call a little bit dramatic, but I kind of found myself in what felt like a deep, dark pit. Um, it wasn't something I really expected to happen. Um, it was a really great challenge last semester, and I, I mentioned that a little bit at the Thanksgiving service, if any of you were there, and um, the whole time I was just reaching for the Lord and um, really trying to lean on Him, and, and it was so hard. I still found myself there, and um, what really gave me a lot of hope is that I was where God wanted me to be in that moment, um, even if it was in the deep, dark pit of gray Indiana and all the challenges that that brought and while Zambia is certainly a lot more of an exciting place um, to go it was where God wanted me to be and so as I went where the Lord wanted me to be just as um, in such specific little moments like being with that NICU baby we were where God wanted us to be um, his presence was just incredibly tangible um, it wasn't some big clarity moment of oh my gosh I never understood this thing and now I completely get it and He's, he's directly just spelled it out for me entirely, but just, um, I found myself in the beginning going to bed and my thoughts were racing or I had all these situations that I brought with me that I was reflecting on and trying to make sense of them or trying to figure them out. And um, I just found myself as time went on and as I was just leaning more and more into, um, you know, just surrendering myself to the Lord, asking him, okay, God, what do you, how do you want me to, to how do you want to use me today? Um, what do you want to teach me today? And not, you know, taking on this personal responsibility to do that, um, I found myself not going to bed anymore with my thoughts racing. I found myself just being content to not know what I was gonna do later that day or being content to understand that, you know, there's a lot of circumstances in my life, uh, both in Zambia and outside of Zambia, that my own brain is not capable of making sense of. And I really like to do that. I really love to figure out why things are the way that they are or, you know, why did that happen in my life? How is God using that? And um, just amidst experiencing him through the people of Zambia, experiencing him through the total surrender that um, I was really pushed to do through the way uh, life is there, um, I found myself just finding so much more comfort in his peace, so much comfort in just knowing that he's God and um, 
I don't, I'm not personally responsible for making sense of all these things and that um, he holds all of my life in his hands and for that I can rest and even when I come back to the United States, it's okay for me to be fully present uh, where I am um, in, in what I'm doing even though I know where I'm gonna be in May of 2025. Um, and so just through experiencing God, so, so his presence so clearly, experiencing him through the people, um, he just comforted my heart so deeply and I certainly am no longer in that pit. Um, and that's simply just from being where God wanted me to be. Yeah, let me just say, uh, no offense taken when you said about your hair not being there. So I just want you to know that. <laughs> so, uh, uh, Particular Bible verses that you leaned on? Yes, absolutely. Uh, God really, really used scripture for our team. Um, every night, kind of part of our flow of um, what our schedule looked like, we did a devotion each night, and that was written by some friends and family. <clears throat> Thank you. And... Uh, they were just really, really special. It seemed as if every single devotion came at just the right time, um, like that day with the NICU baby. Um, and there were a few of those stories from that moment on, unfortunately. Um, God repeatedly used the same scripture, and it somehow was in our devotion or at the top of someone's journal or in somebody else's you know, personal devotional. And so through these scriptures, um, we can move on. I think that there might be some Yeah, there slides. are some slides. Um, so this first one, it's Psalm 139. And I would say the whole of Psalm 139 became really special. And... It's absolutely the Lord. Um, we were all assigned Tonga names in the language, and mine was Chabota. A little side note about Chabota. We would share our names in church. Every single time I went to share my name, the entire congregation lost their minds. They were knee slapping, cackling, and I don't, I really could not tell you why. I don't know if it's my accent. I perfected the way to say it, but anyway, uh, something about the name Chabota in Zambia. It's a very common name, but they, they think it's hilarious. But it means wonderful. And uh, another, it's not up on the screen, but another really kind of better known part of Psalm 139 is that I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Um, you knit me together in my mother's womb. And so with maternal, as we were reflecting on and learning lots about uh, how babies are made and then seeing babies be born, um, I, I, my heart was already kind of pulled to Psalm 139. And uh, God, again, just it somehow bubbled up consistently, and it wasn't something that I really strived for or searched for and, or worked at on my own accord. I wasn't intentionally really looking there, and yet, um, you know, I find myself in kind of one select moment of alone time on the porch, and all of a sudden God is giving me this beautiful picture of um, all these hard moments from kind of the prior season of my life in that pit where um, even though it was hard, God was there, and that's kind of that verse 7 of where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? There's another part where it says um, even the darkness isn't dark to him. And uh, then I carry that into where I am in the moment in Zambia, and I'm seeing him, you know, with us in these, these labor suites and, and caring for these moms and understanding that uh, we truly are just his hands and feet and um, opening our hearts to, to using him how he wants us to, to be how he wants to use us and um, kind of abandoning selfishness, abandoning my version of what I think that should look like. And then um, that verse 23 and 24, I think I just, just kind of repeated to myself like a liturgy every single night. Um, especially I, coming there, um, even before going there, I, I had the worst sickness I'd ever had in my whole life the day before. I could tell you that in graphic detail because, you know, nursing, if you'd like, but it was bad. I was fighting demons. Um, and so... Uh, even prior, I just, you know, just because you go to some, some new and exciting place, your problems don't disappear. All the things that are hard, all your struggles don't disappear. And so um, just repeating that, search me, God, know my heart. You know me. There's, there's not a single place I can go um, where you won't be there. And, and kind of God really used this verse to show me what that means. And I feel so fortunate that I was able to tangibly experience that. No longer going to bed with racing thoughts. Um, no longer just getting worked up and, and anxious or worried or uh, feeling hung up on things that really aren't my, mine to worry about in the first place, um, either things from the past or things of the future. Um, and just through repeating that 23 through 24 over and over, um, I really, God did such a work in my heart and in my mind and in my soul, um, and that's only something that I can attribute to him. There are other verses? Yes. <laughs> um, so this verse from Matthew 11, I would say if there was any verse that um, could really summarize the trip, it would be this one. It says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. This is Jesus speaking. Um, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And um, I can tell you, God just chose this verse for our team. Um, I, in just even the books that I, I brought with me in our devotions, um, even there was a couple times actually where 
uh, there we were working with mission hospitals, so they're Christian organizations, so they would hand out Bibles, and there would be open Bibles on patients' beds or dropping Bibles, and this would be the verse that um, was left for our team to recognize. And uh, again, just kind of this idea of resting in the Lord and, and kind of giving all of me to uh, who he is and, and the power that he has in our lives um, became really huge. And even just recognizing, especially in um, America, it's so so natural for us to really be striving and really feel like it's our future is ours to hold on to. And, and for me, and the way that I, my brain works, um, I really, again, really love to sort out what's going on? Why did this happen? What's going on in my life? Like, why did I meet this person? And um, it's not always, you know, selfish. Sometimes it's that I really want to understand, like, God, how are you using me? But um, this verse really pushed me to understand, like, I don't need to know that. Um, I don't need to reflect on the past. I don't need to do all of those things because they truly are in God's hands. And um, it's not even my job to really seize my future or make the most of my time because it's God's and it belongs to him. And um, my only, all that he asks of me is to just kind of rest under the, the easy yoke of Christ, um, the easy way of Christ. And I'm so thankful for the country of Zambia and the way that um, it gave opportunity to do that in ways that would be a lot more challenging in yeah. the United States. Mm -hmm. it's, it's natural to be more present. It's natural to kind of slow your heart down and just be in the moment when you're there because that's just how that country is oriented and how they, they operate, how their, their culture is. Um, but it really just was such a beautiful exercise in understanding that um, none of my life is my own and it all belongs to the Lord. Just same in just even seeing that with that NICU baby. Um, and kind of being pushed to surrender to him in that way just completely remolded my heart um, to rest under his easy yoke, to be content with, uh, you know, not studying for that test that I really would like to study for because I'd really love to have a great GPA because that's what's important to Molly, even though I'm in this, this other country and doing all of these other things. Um, but trusting that I'm going to go where God wants me to go or I'm going to bed. Um, one thing about me, I don't, and my mom worked night shifts, so it's probably in my blood, but I can stay up as late as I would like to. Um, it's kind of a, a pride thing, I think, even. Um, and so sometimes there were moments where it was even tangible of just God telling my heart, Molly, no, you should go to bed because you have other responsibilities, and I want you to do a good job at those. So I know that you really want to stay up late and study, but it's better for you to go to bed. And then just experiencing what it's like to lean on him and, and the way that he provided. And my grade was fine, and I did not need to stay up and watch the sunrise and get two hours of sleep because... There are other things more important, um, and that's really up to the Lord. And so I just feel so privileged to have rested under the easy yoke of Christ in Zambia. Um, but then also recognizing that God's the same here um, as he was there and, and kind of learning and readjusting my life and kind of doing this great reprioritization of what's important to me and what, um, what, where does God want me to be and not where does Molly want, want Molly to be for, for her selfish ways or for her desires or for what she thinks God's doing in her life, but truly how he's speaking to her. You had a profound experience around this next verse, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. <laughs> I did. Um, so we can move on to the, the last one. Uh, so same thing as God works. Uh, this was not something I sought out. This one wasn't even in a devotion, and I could not tell you even where it, where it, where it came up. But all of a sudden, uh, again, it was just a verse that I read daily. And prior to coming on this trip, again, I, I mentioned that deep, dark pit that I never really asked to be in. And um, we all were asked to kind of prayerfully select words for the trip that um, could really center our hearts and push our hearts to uh, surrender to the Lord or to even just be prayerful about what God wants and how he wants to use us on this trip. And so the word that I had chosen was revive. Um, and I wasn't really sure where it came from, but I just kind of felt it on my heart. And there were plenty of people uh, who really loved us and, and specifically were even praying over that, that specific word. And I didn't really know what that meant or what that looked like. Um, and all I knew was that I was going where God wanted me to be. Um, I was thrilled about that, absolutely thrilled about that. Um, this is something that I had wanted to do and felt God calling me to for years, um, even before I went to college. And so it was just so freeing um, and such a beautiful, just again, freeing place to be, um, knowing that I was where God wanted me to be. But again, I didn't know how he was gonna use me, what he was gonna do. And so I, again, found myself doing that kind of overthinky thing of, okay, I'm in Zambia, like, I have to do a good job, I want to do a good job, how can I do that, how, what am I supposed to do today, like, what can I do today, oh my goodness, like, ah, oh, dang it, I missed my alone time this morning, like, my day is ruined, which, you know, humans are dramatic, so of course I'm going to think that, it's not true, um, 
And God just reminded me over and over uh, to not dwell on the past, to not be trying to sort out all of these things because he has me in Zambia and this is specifically where he has me and where he wants to use me. And not only that, but also recognizing that um, God has my future in, in his hands and all of, all of my days were ordained before they each came to be. That's from Psalm 139. Um, and resting in the fact that God is doing all of these new things and just finding contentment and peace in that truth and knowing that it belongs to God and not really knowing what those new things are. Um, and again, making a way in the wilderness, making streams in the wasteland, I sometimes would even fill in that deep, dark pit. And I, again, I wish that I could go into detail of specifics and, and the people that prompted my heart and what that looked like, but um, kind of in a very certain, in a kind of summarize, summarizing way, the Lord just through my time in Zambia, completely revived my heart. Um, mm. My love of people, my passion for people, mm. my passion for nursing. Um, kind of in, in being a nursing student in the United States and being kind of in the culture of being a nursing student, it's super tempting to be so focused on getting excellent grades and I tend to be a little bit achievement oriented. And um, I began to kind of unintentionally lose sight of even why I was passionate about nursing or um, kind of was exhausted all the time. and never really had time for people the way that I wanted, and uh, Zambia provided so many opportunities to just live life differently, and God pushed my heart to do that. Like I mentioned, wanting to stay up super late to study, but God pushing me to rest instead, or pushing me to spend some time with friends in the market, or um, with a, li a little kid instead of being on time to class, and through all of those big and small moments, uh, he just completely made me new, and it wasn't something that I, there wasn't anything that I really did other than just um, continually returning to his presence and being available to him. And um, sometimes that was in really small, random moments that I didn't really realize would make a big difference until I reflect. Or um, it was really big moments where God uh, just revealed himself to us and revealed his truth through the comfort of scripture, through the comfort of community, uh, kind words from our team, like, like again, with that, that NICU baby or um, other dear friends that I made uh, in, in the market or in town. And... Um, Again, I just, I'm trying to hold back because I don't want to go into super, super, super detail, but again, God completely revived my heart. And because of that, uh, I found myself just being made new um, and feeling so much more whole uh, because of the way that his presence and his love um, just completely enwrapped me. And again, that was from the surrender that I found myself being pushed to do. And so because of that, um, through even just the testimony of other girls on the team and uh, recognizing all the good work that God did in my heart. Um, I ended up making the decision to be baptized. I, there was never a time in my life where I wasn't a Christian, but um, I just had never been baptized. I was sprinkled as a baby, but um, that wasn't just, that hadn't been something that I had done in my, my life yet. And so when I was given the opportunity to do that, um, I absolutely knew that that was something that God had for me. And I just, again, uh, another really beautiful scripture was Ephesians 3.20. Um, and part of that is that God, promises to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine, um, according to his goodness, and um, as we're being filled to the measure of his fullness. And uh, Zambia allowed me to be filled to the measure of God's fullness, and he did immeasurably more than I could have expected, and that included just this public statement of faith. So if you go back a couple slides, there's some pictures from that, but um, that's just a, a public statement of um, the way that God made me new and the revival work that he did in my heart. And that stretches even outside of myself. Um, there was one girl on our team who gave her life to Christ. Uh, seven of us total were actually baptized uh, through what God did in our heart. And that was completely him. Um, and that also wouldn't be possible without prayer and the love and the support of um, so many of you, so many friends and family who um, just supported me on, on going where God wanted me to be. And the challenges that that brought, and I absolutely, from beginning to end, felt covered in prayer, and um, none of these beautiful things, none of these beautiful stories or pictures would be true if that wasn't for um, the love and the prayer and the support of church Amen. and so many other friends and family members. Stay right there for just a moment, and so let me just take a minute, if I could, and build a bridge to the idea that uh, a, a demonstration of our outward faith in baptism and the idea that we have a chance to go ahead and invite Jesus Christ inside of our life to do a work inside of our heart is something that's not exclusive to being in Zambia or the fact that God can meet us directly here. Let me remind you of these words that we had a chance to already have an opportunity to see in front of us and to read. Uh, forget the former things. God is doing a new thing inside of our heart and inside of our life, and he can do a new work inside of your heart and life. 
Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, all you who are weary, and I'll give you rest. Where do I, can I go from your presence? Where can I flee from your presence? Search me, Lord, and know my heart. Do you know that when we share in the elements of the sacrament of communion, just like in, in baptism, it is an outward demonstration of inviting God to be part of our lives. I want to invite you to even hear the witness that's in front of you about a step of faith that was taken to go abroad and to experience some things that otherwise would have never been experienced and to hear words like revive, surrender, make new, and that God meets us in those moments. I'd like to invite you, will you pause with me before we share together in the elements of communion and let's bow together for prayer. Lord, as we take the cup and as we take bread this morning, we would pray that you'll come that it might be an intersection of your grace, that you can do a renewing work inside of our heart, that you can meet us this morning where we are. And we would pray today that you would help us as well to take steps of faith in your direction. Our hearts are open for what you want to do inside of these moments, Lord, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's put your hands together and thank Molly for being here this morning. Thank you. I'm going to ask the ushers if they'll wait upon us this morning. You are gluten-free this morning. Raise your hand nice and high so I can find you. Keep it up, please. As Jesus gathered together with his disciples, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Take and eat and do this in remembrance of me.
Jesus took the cup. It was an ordinary cup. Something that they had been accustomed to and something that they have been familiar with. But during that moment, he gave it an extraordinary meaning. He said, this cup is the new covenant. It's not like the old covenant. It's the new covenant. My blood is being shed. Every time that you drink this cup from this point forward, would you be mindful of Calvary? Be mindful that sacrifice has been paid for your sin. Be mindful that the price has been paid. Be mindful that you too can have forgiveness of sin. Even areas that you think might have disqualified you, you're not disqualified. I can meet you in that moment. This is the cup of the new covenant. Take and drink it. So here is one thing that I am aware of, that uh, people are wired in two different categories. There are time people, and there are event people. Uh, event people, they show up and they're staying for the duration. It doesn't make a difference how long it's going to be, 30 minutes, 40 minutes. These are the people that you come, come to your house, and they're event people. And so you have to say, well, I'm not sure what you're doing, but I'm going to bed now. Okay, they're event people. <laughs> they're event people. And then there are time people. You know, time people, uh, they, they, everything is, is pretty well calculated in situations like that. I want you to understand, I certainly know that. But I want you to go ahead and invite you in this situation. Uh, there are things that Molly may have said this morning that the Holy Spirit is using inside of your heart, even in this moment. And you may have something completely, completely not on the radar at all about what we've talked about this morning but God is working inside of your heart or you're carrying something in the life of your life or for someone else, uh, we want to go ahead and create some space this morning for just a few minutes uh, to go ahead and to invite you. If you would like to come for a particular moment of healing prayer, uh, we want to invite you to do that. And so please understand, some of you are going to go that way, which is perfectly fine. I just ask you to do that quietly. Some of you are going to remain which is perfectly fine. We want to go ahead and, and pray with you. Brian and Rhonda Cowan are going to come over there. Kristen's going to be here. I'll be here. The measles are going to be here. And so we want to go ahead and close the service effectively now in this moment, but do want to go ahead and say to you, uh, recognizing that there are some who come with heavy hearts this morning or God is doing something inside of your life that you just want to go ahead and commit back to him, we want to give you that opportunity this morning. So I'm going to go ahead and close in prayer. And again, uh, we want to ask Kathy to play quietly. Uh, if you need to go in that direction, please go quietly. But if you would like to come for a particular area of prayer, don't miss that opportunity this morning. Maybe even God's doing something in your heart or inside of your life around areas of mission or areas of faith or areas of, you know, I need him to revive me this morning like you've done that work inside of Molly's life. And so we want to give these remaining moments to him. But let's close our time together. And now unto him that's able to keep you from falling, to present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior, to whom honor, power, majesty, and dominion belong now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning.